So John Carpenter's The Thing is arguably one of the best sci-fi movies ever made. It's a film to me that stood the test of time and this is due to its story, special effects and also its titular character The Thing. Capable of imitating any life form, it's a creature that can be a best friend one minute and the most terrifying thing that you've ever seen the next. What I love about the movie is that almost every aspect of it has a mysterious element to it and the idea of not having all the answers is something that thematically appears throughout. Whether it's the ambiguous ending or the creature itself, we never really feel like we have all the information and I think this is something that's helped to keep the movie as a talking point all these years later. However, that's where I come in. I want to spoil it all and try and give you some answers to what the creature really is as I think it's such a fascinating thing to talk about that is definitely worth a video. I've gone through numerous interviews, books, comics and everything that I could find to try and piece together all the information that I can on what the creature is. Throughout this video, I'm going to be going through it all to try and explain the thing and why it's one of the most dangerous entities in the entire universe. If you enjoy the video, please hit the thumbs up button and also make sure you subscribe for breakdowns like this every day. By the way, a huge thank you for clicking this. Now let's get into the thing. Now before looking back at the 1982 movie, I actually want to go to the planned TV sequel titled Return of the Thing. A nice little play on the Lord of the Rings books, this sequel miniseries was originally commissioned by the Sci-Fi Channel to take place after the events of the John Carpenter movie. On the Best Movies Never Made podcast, the creative team behind it went into what they learned about the creature when crafting their planned work and the scripts are available to read online if you want to check them out. They said that Sci-Fi originally wanted to wipe the slate clean and start afresh which led to some raised eyebrows. The heads at the studio said they even thought they could have the thing turn into stuff like a chair or a plank of wood, but the newly onboard scriptwriters rightly said that idea sounded stupid. They led with the idea that they should definitely go with a sequel and they started to see everything that they could find on the creature. Looking into it all, they saw what the creature was capable of and the script outlines that it's the perfect mimic on every level. If the person it's copying has a limp, it mimics that. If they have a missing tooth, it mimics that. And it makes complete copies of someone down to a cellular level. This is seen the most in the character Norris who has a hot defect, which is copied by the creature perfectly. Eventually, this causes him to pass out. And though the cells within him lie dormant, they're awakened when they feel attacked by the electrical paddles. Now, the writer David Leslie Johnson stated that if a person had a cold, that it would even copy the virus and this would give it a way to become airborne and infect others. In the commentary for the 2011 film, it stated that the thing has no true form because it actually exists at a microscopic level and this is kind of where I want to start really delving into things. I'm sure you know, but just in case you don't, the movie's actually based on the book Who Goes There. It's a short story that I think is available on YouTube as an audiobook and it actually narrates some of the events from the creature's perspective at some points. In that its true form is listed as being a blue snake head creature with three red eyes which I'm sure was terrifying at the time for people reading it in 1938. There was actually a competition thrown for people to draw what they thought the thing looked like which yeah to be fair that, that does look quite scary. However sticking with the cinematic version it doesn't actually have a specific shape and it's as formless as a virus is. Before fully researching this video, I don't know why but I always thought of the thing as being something that was basically an alien shapeshifter that could transform into looking like others. However, after doing a deep dive on the thing, I realised that a lot of my assumptions were in fact wrong. Instead of being one singular being, this is something that's made up of many microscopic organisms that all come together to form one whole. The best way I can think to describe it is, say, imagine, right, imagine that you caught the flu. There isn't really one specific part of the flu that you can pinpoint within you and instead it spreads out but the virus works together in unison to cause you to get sick. Now imagine the flu could come together, look like something and that it had a personality. That's basically what it is. The thing is a walking talking cold with an agenda that can consume something and shift about its molecules in order to perfectly imitate everything about it. Because it's copying your brain on a genetic level it also takes your memories, thought patterns and everything that makes you you. Whether it's faults in your muscles that cause limping, missing teeth or your grey hairs, everything is copied across perfectly. Now if it even touches any of your bodily fluids like blood or saliva, then it will start consuming and altering your molecules. We see this demonstrated in the 2011 film when the two-headed version absorbs the character Adam. Look closely and you can see the attack that it goes for is by putting his and its mouth together as this gives it a way to access his saliva. 
Now from here its cells can rapidly copy and imitate him, bringing him together into this grand organism. Now when looking up scientific terms for this, the best one I could find is that it's a colonial organism. It's a really cool term, I think, and this also explains why it's so weak to fire. Fire burns and destroys things down to a cellular level, which is why it's one of the only things that are capable of killing it. Bullets don't work as it can shift and alter itself to work around this, and thus it has to be burned in order to kill it fully. Now that I'm talking about it being more of a reactive organism, it does have somewhat of an intelligence to it when it becomes unified. In copying beings, it of course takes their memories and brain patterns, and thus it's able to think for itself by having a sort of hive mind. This also means that it has highly advanced brains at its disposal too, and if it copied an alien life form capable of space travel, then it too learns this ability. This is why we catch the Blair thing building its own spaceship at the end of the movie, because the creatures clearly copied a life form that was capable of doing this. Within our own DNA, we of course have data passed on genetically that goes through the ancestors in our family tree. This is a similar sort of thing to the creature, with it copying this data and thus having it within its cells. However, being like a virus also means that it has an instinctive side to it that can be broken apart. Though the cells work together, it's when they panic that they're at their weakest. Working mainly on instincts, when they're attacked, they tend to resort to what all creatures do, which is their own survival. Now, this has a lot of downsides to it, and with each of these elements being self-interested, they can actually cause harm to the others. We see this in the case of Palmer, who at one point in the movie points out Norris's head. This may have been done to shift suspicion away from him and gain trust, but it's clearly a selfish action that leads to one of the thing's deaths. I think the best way to look at it is to view the thing as being something that works in unison to be at its best. When all the cells are together, they carry a great sense of intelligence because they're working together to problem solve. Why I think this is, is because it's clear the thing's intelligence depends on its size. For example, when it's a fully formed human, it can operate at a tactical level and also strategize things. On the opposite side of this, when it's the size of a splash of blood, its instinct simply is to run away. We can see that the size of the creature vastly denotes how much intelligence it has, as when it's like arms in the 2011 movie, they just run around on the floor, whereas when it's Blair, it's creating and building ships. Now in this panic state, it will often pull from its own memory, and it's capable of unleashing any of the forms that it's copied at any point when it wants. These of course have to be organisms, but it means that it can gain gigantic teeth, tentacles, and whatever it needs in the situation. However, I think the thing's greatest weapon comes from the fact it sows paranoia and distrust amongst those it hasn't been able to copy. The movies have people slowly starting to turn on each other, which allows the thing to move in the shadows and make its moves from there. Much like a virus, its goal is to simply consume, survive, and then go on to spread into other beings. Thus, it's constantly searching out new targets and ways to keep itself going. Assimilating and surviving through this is all that it cares about, and this makes it an extremely dangerous entity. Running a simulation on it, Blair's working show that it would take 27,000 hours to take over Earth. This is roughly three years, and it would mean infecting every human, animal, insect, and form of life on our planet. It's estimated that there's over 1 trillion life forms on the planet, which shows how much that would involve imitating. A trillion seconds is 31,000 years, giving you a rough idea of how grand that scale is. Now one thing I love in the book that unfortunately doesn't make it to the movie is that the camp's terrified about the thing making it to a bird. Back when it was written, helicopters and planes weren't as commercially available as they are today, and thus the group are scared sh** this that it's going to get into a bird and fly its way out of there. Now when looking at its backstory, we actually know a lot about it from the 2011 film. In the behind the scenes, they stated the ship we see at the start was actually part of an interstellar expedition that was out in the universe conducting zoological studies. They collected a number of different species from other planets and placed them into pods as part of their cargo. On one planet they came across the thing and trapped it so that it could be examined, but it managed to break free and it took over the craft. In a desperate move, the pilot crashed the ship in an attempt to kill it, and the creature was buried in the ice for 100,000 years. Peter Watts also wrote a short story from the thing's perspective in which it outlined itself as an ambassador that was travelling throughout the galaxy to reshape the universe into being fit for purpose. That's not considered canon, but it is an interesting thing to bring up when discussing the creature. Anyway, that leads us into the events of the 2011 movie, which then goes into the 82 film, before we get to those doomed sequel spin-offs. Unfortunately, we haven't really got a canonised version of what happens after this, with the video games and comic series differing in some ways. The sci-fi series also went off in a different version, 
And if you'd like to see me break these all down, then let me know in the comments below. Now, if you want more thin content, then make sure you check out our breakdown of the 1982 movie, which will be linked on screen right now. I am going to cover the 2011 version as well at some point, so make sure you stay locked so you don't miss it. By the way, thanks for clicking the video. I've been Paul, let's see you next time. You take care, peace.